On a cold January night back in Atlanta, Georgia, a little suburb that I grew up in, I preached my first message. Now, I don't want to get anybody too excited, but it was a very short message. And so, don't believe that maybe that's going to happen today, but it was a very short message. In fact, it was just four words. Jesus is my Lord. You know, on that January night that no one on this earth remembers this day but me, I stepped into a baptistry that was ice cold because it was cold outside and the heater was broken. I do remember that. But I remember standing before this church family, New Hope Baptist Church, and declaring that I identified publicly with Jesus Christ. I knew that it didn't save me. I didn't understand all the theology. I certainly didn't understand Baptist polity, but I did know this, that Jesus loved me, and that He had called me, and on that night I declared... Jesus is my Lord. You know, today, as we're coming out of a pandemic and God is doing a new work in this church, we have an incredible opportunity to celebrate today right out there on this East Lawn. As you came in today, you may have seen a number of chairs out there, and they're there for us. We're not going to have a benediction today. We're just going to adjourn to the East Lawn, and we have 42-plus people that are going to be in two baptistries, and they're going to be declaring their faith in Christ. That is a blessing. That is something to celebrate. After all of these months and years, we're baptizing more today than I believe we did a year ago. Isn't that incredible? In a whole year, we may be baptizing more in one day. God's doing a new work here. Be out there, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we exit at the end of the service, but I'm grateful for that, and it's a wonderful way to end this series out of the book of Galatians. You know, back on July 3rd, Pastor Jeff was in this room, and he spoke to the entire church. And he began this series on Galatians, talking about the freedom that we have in Christ. I hope you've been here for some of it. They're all online. You can go back, and you can listen to them. But he began to talk with us about what it means to be free in Christ, and that our freedom in Christ was found in the grace, the grace that we find in Jesus And we've talked about this all across these months, and the heart of the book of Galatians is grace, but also the threat to grace. The threat to grace. And Paul unapologetically argues all across this epistle for faith and hope, and what we sing today, that our faith and hope and our identity, our life as believers is found in the cross. It's found in the cross. It's found in what Jesus did for us on that cross. Now, it's interesting, as you go through the book of Galatians, that is the central theme. He's arguing against a group of people who were introducing a heresy to the Galatian church, but Paul also would move off into other topics. The last couple of weeks, we've talked about the deeds of the flesh. We've talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Last week, the pastor was in here, and we talked about a freedom to persevere and talked about the law of sowing and reaping. But Paul always circles back to this idea of grace. And today, he kind of lands the plane. As I was thinking about this, I thought about something that happened to me a few years ago. I was flying into Chicago, and I was on an American Airlines Super 80. I loved those. I don't know why they retired them, but I know where I was seated. I was in the right side of the plane, in the back, by the window, uneventful flight. We were coming in. Those back wheels touched down, and just as they touched down... That pilot gave that plane everything it had, and we shot up like a rocket. Now, I'm comfortable with the fact that NASA's never going to ask me to fly. I I think that's probably a given in my life, but I know a little bit about what it might feel like because we went back in our seats, someone screamed, and I apologize later on for screaming, but I mean, it was (laughs) just one of those things that you knew something had happened, you didn't know what, and what we found out was that the pilot, as he touched down, saw that somebody was intruding into the runway, and his quick actions averted the tragedy. And that's almost what Paul is doing here. Paul is circling around this book, and he's seeking to land it, and all of a sudden, he takes back off, and he addresses this central issue about the integrity of the gospel. So if you take notes, and I hope you do, Our first point is this, the clarity of the gospel. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. In just a few moments, we're going to be reading 11 through 13. Galatians 6, beginning in verse 11. Paul writing, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. 
Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. Now, what's he saying here? Well, in verse 11, he talks about how he has taken the pen from his scribe. Paul has been dictating this epistle, this letter, and he takes the pen and he begins to write in his own hand. Now, he does that in others. You can look at 2 Thessalonians, among others, and you'll see that. But what's he doing here? He makes a point. This is for my hand. Look at my large letters. Is it that he is trying to assert that this is from the Apostle Paul, his apostolic authority? He may have. That might actually be part of it. But I like to think also, as he's dictating this letter, and he's beginning to kind of land the plane, he comes back one more time to the central issue, and he is so filled with passion, he takes the pen and he begins to write it himself so that he can convey exactly the passion he has for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in this book, we've seen Paul has stated very, very clearly that salvation is by grace alone. We are justified by faith, the doctrine of justification. Back in Galatians 2.21, he says this, If righteousness could be gained apart from the law, Christ died for nothing. I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to ponder it. If I have Jesus, I have grace, but I add to it my good works, my my service, my giving, my church attendance, just being an all-around nice guy, if it's Jesus plus whatever I bring to the table, what Paul is saying, that's not life. That's death. And what we've seen in this book is that there was a group called the Judaizers that were seeking to come to the Gentile converts in Galatia and introduce the idea of Jewish law. Jewish tradition, Jewish ritual, and he symbolizes that in the physical act of circumcision. Jesus plus, Jesus plus what I bring to the table. You know, that was a first century heresy. It's really a 21st century heresy. Jesus plus. So he comes back and he says this, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? If you read on, he says, it's to make a good impression To make a good impression. Well, who are they trying to impress? Well, there's probably two parties. One would be the Jews. The Jews. There was Jewish persecution of this new church. We know that. Go to the book of Acts. We know there was persecution. And so these Judaizers were saying, if we could get these Gentile converts to convert to Judaism in a sense, in other words, if they would adopt Jewish law, ritual tradition, again, symbolized through the physical act of circumcision, the Jews are going to leave us alone. We'll take away their, their ability to come after us. It might have been also Rome. Rome. Judaism was an officially recognized religion by the Roman Empire. And so if they could have a physical identification of circumcision, that was undeniable identification with Judaism, then they would have the legal protection of the empire. There's a lot that's happening right here. And in verse 13, Paul says, and he just boils it down, it's none of those things. They want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. That was the issue. They were seeking, not a win-win, they were seeking to elevate themselves. They were seeking a position of prominence. That was their boast, and their boast wasn't in the cross. Their boast was in their own human efforts, and in so doing, they were perverting the gospel. There's a contrast. There is a grace uh, opportunity here. Jesus plus nothing. That's the clarity of the gospel. When we talk about the clarity of the gospel, it is grace and grace alone. Jesus plus nothing equals life. It equals salvation, eternal life. And so this group was seeking to introduce law into it and human efforts, and it was going to equal death. Back in Galatians 5, verse 11, he says this, But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, in other words, again, works, law, 
why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. What's Paul saying here, the offense of the cross? He's talking about the message of the cross. And the message of the cross is an offense. It's offensive. It is a scandal. Within the Greek, that would be a transliteration of the word scandalon. It's a purely biblical or ecclesiastical word. You'll find it in the Greek Old Testament, in the Greek New Testament. It's generally translated, generally translated as stumbling block, an offense. Listen as I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those from whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Let me share two passages. The second one is Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense. Who's Isaiah writing about? The coming Messiah. He's writing about Jesus. A rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel. A trap and a snare for the inhabitants of Israel. What's he talking about there? The scandal of the cross. The scandal of the cross. The scandal of the cross for the Jew was that the Messiah that they had prayed and they had dreamed about was not coming as a conqueror. He was not coming to rid Israel of the Roman yoke. He was coming to die. He was coming to die. Jesus didn't come to be the wisest teacher of all time, although he was. He came for Calvary. He came to provide a way to do that for us, which we could never do ourselves. He paid the price for sin. He lived a perfect, sinless life, and yet he was nailed to that cross as a criminal. Jesus taught an ethic of love that no one in history has ever come close to. But Jesus demonstrated his love. Jesus came for you. He came for me. That's grace. That's grace. That's the clarity of the gospel. You know, with our ministry team in the last number of months, we've used an expression, clarity's kind. I've got some of our ministers here. They've heard us say that. Clarity is kind. Well, what does that mean? Well, in a business relationship, it would be that employee employers are all talking the same language. They're all shooting for the same thing. You can talk clearly and you can express thoughts back with one another. Clarity is kind. It's kind in personal relationships. You know, as I wrote this, I was thinking about my wife. Now, if you haven't met Maria, you've missed a treat. She's wonderful. And we dated two separate occasions. One time I was still in college, and then there was a break, and uh, we dated a few years later, and the rest is history. But that first time, we dated for a couple of months. Been set up by our pastor's wife, and we went out, and it was good. You know, it was good. So I, I, we'd go out, and so I called her one, one week, and I said, hey, would you like to go to dinner Friday night? Well, I'm busy. Oh, okay, well, what about Saturday night? I'm busy. Do you sense a clarity beginning to emerge? I said, what about after church on Sunday? Before I could get it out, I'm busy. Now, again, we all know I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, so I thought, I'm going to make one more shot at this. How about next Friday night? I'm busy. Well, I'm going to assume you're busy on Saturday night as well, and I got the message. Clarity. The gospel is clear. Clarity is kind. Let me read you some passages. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all, that is us. That is us in here today without Christ. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I am separated from God because of my sin, but he makes a way through Jesus Christ. Romans 5.8, I said a moment ago, Jesus came to demonstrate his love. It says here, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, so appropriate to this message. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, 
not of works, so that no one can boast. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. If you're joining us today online or you're here in the sanctuary and you would say, I'm exploring faith, you've heard the clarity of the gospel message. We are saved by grace, by faith, and that alone. Again, if you're taking notes, number two, the centrality of the gospel. Now, in recent weeks, we've been taking a survey at Park Cities. I saw it flash on the banner screen earlier. You can still take it. Go to pcbc.org, and it's going to be open to the end of the month. I've had a high-level look at it, and it's interesting some of the things that you have to say. And we're going to be looking at that. We want to know, again, how best to serve our church, but also how we might best serve our immediate community in the broader city. But there was one question on there that I really wanted to look at, and it was a rating of our church as a gospel-focused church from one to five. Now, from what I've seen, and again, it's preliminary, we've rated very high there. Well, my friends, that's a good thing because if we're a New Testament church, we are to be gospel-focused. That's why you see Pastor Jeff and any minister at this platform, when we speak, we speak from Scripture. We don't speak man's opinion. We're not quoting the daily news. We're speaking from God's Word. If you go to a connect group, and I hope all of you are in a connect group or a service group where you come together as a small group. It's where a big old church becomes like a small family. You love one another. Well, how do you build your relationships? You do it around the Word. You do it around Scripture. At Park Cities, we believe that God calls us to the gospel. Why do we serve? You know, last week we had a wonderful serve video in this service. Why do we serve? Why do we serve all across the city? Why are we down in the valley at the border? Why are we in Guatemala and in the Caribbean and India and Guatemala and all sorts of places? Why? Because of the gospel. And we don't go out of some altruistic desire just to be do-gooders or for people to say, look at that Park Cities. Man, they do it. Isn't that great? That's not why we serve. We serve because of the gospel. I've heard Jeff say it in here before. We're all about Jesus. You know, as best I can tell, and I'm a pretty good student of this church's history, that began in 1939. We're all about Jesus. Look with me in verse 14 and 15. Paul says, May I never boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision mean anything that counts is a new creation. What counts is a new creation? Let's look at that. He says, May I never boast. That's the NIV. If you, are you reading from ESV, it says, But far be it for me to boast. It has been said, God forbid, although the name of God's not in there, but it is a very strong negative. It's hard to translate is what I've been told, but it essentially means may I never, ever, never, ever boast in anything but the cross. The cross. You know, some of you use Oswald Chambers as your devotional material, and in writing about this passage, he, he wrote this, the bedrock of Christianity is a personal passionate devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. A personal, passionate devotion. That's our boast. But you know, let's, let's be honest. We all boast about something, right? I've got a little five-year-old grandson. He has his birthday party today. And I'll say, William, show me your muscles. And he goes like that and shows me his elbows. That kid's got strong elbows. He's a boy, and boys brag about their strength. They brag about their athletic ability. They brag about their performance. We brag about our academic achievements and all the way through school, what we accomplish, what we're doing. We brag about the school we might get accepted to. We don't mention the ones that didn't. We sometimes brag about our football teams. We brag about our spouses and our neighborhoods, our vacations. We used to brag about our portfolios until the last year. I mean, we brag about a lot. We brag about a lot. And what Paul is saying here is, may I never boast in anything apart from the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's your boast? What's your boast? If you are a follower of Jesus, at the very core of your identity is the boast of Jesus. Now think about it as a church. You know, I hate to tell you this. If you ever go to a pastor's meeting, there's a lot of boasting. Some of it's subtle and some of it's not. 
And as church members, we'll boast about things. We'll boast about the beauty of this sanctuary. I love our sanctuary. I love the chapel. I love our facilities. I love the fact that we have land behind us to dream what God is going to do in the next generation. I love all those things. I love that we have a pastor that preaches scripture. I love all of our ministers. I love our music. I love the sanctuary choir. I love the bands. I love the Spanish language. I love those things. But if I make that my boast, my friends, what I'm doing is I have a misplaced affection. A misplaced affection. And it needs to be right-sized. John Stott writes this, We need to visit Calvary, for it is there that we sink to our true size. The centrality of the gospel will right-size me. It will right-size us. May it never be that our boast is at our own works and our own abilities. Number three, there's a reality of the gospel. A reality of the gospel. Look with me, verse 16. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Amen. So what's he saying? Look in verse 16. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. What's he saying? Well, it translates out a measuring rod. So you can measure yourself, measure life, like with a yardstick. He's saying that our measure is different if we're a follower of Jesus. How we boast is different. How we, how we speak of success is measured not by what we can achieve, but by what he's done. Again, the reality of the cross, the reality of the gospel. Paul has said in this letter, he's a new creation. In other words, he has a new, a new focus to his life. I'm set free from the patterns of this world. Again, just that attempt to just make myself look a little bit better than my neighbor. To feel better about myself? No, I've got a new focus, and the focus is the gospel. He says, I have a new boast, and it's all in grace. For the Judaizers, they had missed it. They had missed it. They valued forms over substance. Ritual, again, this idea of a physical identification over relationship. A cultural identification over the reality of faith. It's almost like this. They had one foot in and one foot out. And the reality is by doing that, you lose it all. You lose it all. And what Paul is saying here is that we find our life, our identity as Christians in the grace of God. You know, I said this in the first hour. We live in a world that is craving to see authentic love. Go home today, pick up the morning news, and just read about the degradation of our world. All the pain and the loss. The world, the city of Dallas, your neighborhood, needs to see love being expressed. Paul talked about that in Galatians chapter 5. He says there's a fruit of the Spirit that flows out of one who's following Christ whose boast is grace, and people can see a difference, and it's the fruit, it's the love, the joy, the peace, patience. This world needs to see true goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. That's the fruit of following God. But some people, and this is, a, this is much like the first century, tend to take the message of Christianity and make it like a Christian karma. If I do good, I'm going to get good. You've heard people say, and sometimes they're joking, you know, there's, God's got these scales. The big guy's got scales. And if I can just do a little bit more, a little bit more on that day, he's going to welcome me on in. And it's on them. That is Jesus plus. And that was a heresy in the first century. It's a heresy in the 21st century. Paul goes on to say he was crucified with Christ. Well, what does he mean? He means that he has crucified his ego, not physically, his pride, his drive. He has submitted it to God. God is his boast. Again, the opinion of others. If you look at the Apostle Paul before the Damascus Road when he was uh, um, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, as he says, Paul had a drive, and the drive was about himself. When he became a believer, his drive was about the gospel. 
Eugene Peterson says it this way, the life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, let me say this before we close. This is a great message when all seems to be going well. You know, when everything's up to the right. But we all know there's trouble in life. There's trials. Sometimes the doctor comes in and the report's not what you thought it would be. There's pains and losses. Jesus said you're going to encounter trouble in this world. Sometimes you're doing all the right things, and you're like the disciples. Jesus said, get in the boat. You got in the boat, and you got caught in a life-threatening storm. Well, how do you handle that? How do you handle that in a message like this? Well, I was thinking about it. I was thinking about a couple of weeks ago. I did a memorial service. Remarkable woman. For 20 years, she battled cancer. It was aggressive from the beginning, and she fought and she fought. Weekly chemos. But you know what? She was defined not by her disease, but by her faith. When you talked with her, it wasn't ever about how she was feeling. She didn't want to talk about that. She wanted to talk about what was happening. She was a generous, godly woman who loved to build Scripture into people, very engaged in Bible studies, but also in service. She was defined by her faith. She was defined by her faith. Paul says here in verse 17, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Well, what's he saying there? Well, if you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, and you go on down, he details all of the hardships of his life, and his body bore the scars. Sometimes life is difficult. Sometimes life is difficult. And when we find our identity and we center on the grace of God, he gives us the ability to push on through. That's the value of a church family, honestly. It's the value of being in a group where we come around and we love one another and we support one another. But it starts with how we identify ourselves and we identify ourselves in grace. And so this is a message for all of us. If you're online and you're watching, maybe you're exploring faith and faith issues. You've heard the clarity of the gospel message today. The same for us in the sanctuary. If you'd like to talk more about faith, you've never placed faith and trust in Jesus. I know every week we have people here that are thinking through this. Clarity is kind. We've given you the clarity today. We'd love to talk with you right here at the altar today. We're not going to be doing next steps in the lobby, and I'll tell you why in a moment. It's going to be down here. If you're here today and you've never made that testimony, Jesus is my Lord, today could be that day. We'd love to talk with you about what it means to follow Jesus through baptism. And if you're ready... We're ready for you. We've got clothes. We've got towels. You can come down right here. We're a one-stop shop. And we'll help you at that point. And you can be one of those, either this week or in upcoming weeks, that declares their personal faith. Again, it's not what saves you. It is an identification. You are declaring that Jesus is your Lord. You may want to join the church like the 20-something people we saw on the screen earlier today. You can do all of that. As we close today, Paul says in verse 16, peace and mercy, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. He says in verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if you go back to the beginning, as he's introducing the epistle, he starts with grace, he ends with grace. It's all grace. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come and to open your word. I thank you for these people that are here, and I pray, Lord, that for all of us, we'd ask you, what are you saying to me in this message? What's the message for me this day? And then what am I going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? And may we act in faith. So, Lord, would you speak to each of us today? And for those, again, that want to have a conversation, come here to the altar, and we're going to have people here to assist you. We thank you for grace. We thank you for Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.